Good to see everyone. So as Amy mentioned, I used to be an investment banker for 20 years and advising companies on M&A, future-proofing themselves through acquisitions. And over that time, I realized that M&A was shifting from buying market share, re new regions, adjacent technologies to survival. So my interest moved to looking more in terms of what is actually the meaning of these investments and this M&A in terms of, if you're thinking in terms of foresight strategy, what does it mean medium term? Where are these industries going? And so what I wanted to do with you guys over the next 15, 20 minutes is really just simply look at some of the recent transactions where they, they for sort of controlling M&A acquisitions or whether they're investments. And what does it tell us in terms of the direction where some of these industries might lead? So we're looking at time spans, which are not the next six, 12 months, but hopefully you'll find it of interest. <clears throat> I think one quote I, I love from Amara's law is effectively that we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short term, but underestimate the technology, the effect in the long term. And I think this is, this is very relevant for this, what I call the deceptive phase of where things are. So if you're looking at things on a quarter by quarter basis, valuations, number of deals, rollouts, proof of concept, the consumer embracing the technologies, it's sort of hype and hype, hype and hype. I think if you fast forward and project in the medium to longer term, the effect of this, it can be sometimes deceptive. On the, on the usual suspects, I'd say they've all been acquiring quite, quite significantly. Most of these are quite small, specific acquisitions. That's the case for the, for the US, Asia, and China. It's even more. The bats are obviously um, <coughs> Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. There's slightly less disclosure about it for the, for the Chinese. But to be honest, even for the, the usual suspects, it's usually not very clear exactly what they're buying, whether it's a few people, they're quite small deals, et cetera. But what you can be sure is that together with their own R&D is that it sets the sort of trajectory towards um, <clears throat> areas of investment and probably breakthroughs over time, which will be significant. If you look at the different industries, I think today, what's kind of more pervasive, intuitive, and, and to some degree embraced is everything to do with the gaming, everything to do with entertainment. It's a little bit easier for the consumer to kind of visualize it. You have quite a few interesting fundraisings from the virtual YouTubers, from you know, the Gree in Japan um, <clears throat> with Wright Flyer Live Entertainment. You have a few on the, on the cinema side with um, you know, immersive uh, cinema. You can have a virtual room. You're walking around with friends or doing whatever you want with friends, and you kind of all cohabitate in this sort of virtual space. You have Verizon, which is interested in something quite interesting to allow the consumer to make their own VR content. <clears throat> and of course, everything happening around Niantic, et cetera, which is the elephant in the room. But effectively, this is the user-generated content for VR. A lot of investments, a lot of acquisitions in the space. On the professional side, again, you're seeing, you know, Adobe obviously is trying to stay cutting edge in this regard. Recent acquisition from some of the carvers from Niantic with um, Oculus Medium. You have <clears throat> an old acquisition from Google on the professional um, AR grade cameras, quite interesting investment. Um, by Insta360. And again, this is professional, so this is $14,000, $15,000 price points. I'm going to take two seconds to zoom in to retail because I think this is an interesting area where there's been both investment, M&A, and where it's not just looking at the next you know, five years. It's, it's today. And if you go to China, it's even yesterday. Retail is not about retail anymore. It's certainly not about technology. It's, it's about <clears throat> the digital, the reach, and the storytelling to get directly to the consumer. It's about the personalization, the experiential, testing the consumer experience. It's about the insights and the recommendation you get from that experiential in, in, in experience. And it's about the immediacy in terms of the visualization. And when you put that all together, effectively, that's where the different constituents of XR come into play and make that happen. And it's happening, this is today, relatively uh, mature, quote unquote. <clears throat> so it goes from virtual try-ons for cosmetics it goes from smart mirrors where you can try the different clothes. It goes from everything around visualizing a store, 
in 3Ds to anticipate where you should place products, how the consumer is reacting to those. It's an entire world of technology which is built to propel this engine around immersive retail. <clears throat> Some of the interesting companies, and back to our theme around M&A and investment, Walmart acquired Spatial Ant in that regard. Very interesting Israeli company in Context Solutions, which allows you to have basically a complete visualization of the store, every single piece of stock, everything, and then connect that with where the consumer is looking at, how he's <coughs> pulling things off, what's been purchased where in the past, and then combining that data and those insights to, to recommendations. L'Oréal acquired Modiface, which allows you effectively to, to try, on, um, <clears throat> try on makeup. So Sephora, for those who know, has uh, one of its sort of marketing lines around visual artists. This is facial tracking, computer vision. But effectively, you're looking at real-time real 3D facial recognition. It's allowing you to track, to render what it looks like by trying this or that lipstick or makeup. It has also other startups which have skin recognition. And you're trying thousands of products. You can do that from home, from a store. Um, and that is effectively, <clears throat> the more you think about the sort of constituents around XR, that, is, that allows that um, to, be, to be very much the case. Um, on the, on the glasses side, of course, it's slightly rudimentary the, in terms of clunkiness. It's not yet um, <clears throat> something that's you know, mass market. You also have the price points, which are not yet sufficiently low for everybody to be buying them, and a number of other factors. But <clears throat> interestingly, three fundings of 30 million plus this year in 2019, purely around the, the hardware, so the, the glasses themselves, you have, within that, one of them is, is North, it's a US company, which um, its focus line is actually pretty much the, <coughs> the Warby Parker model. They actually look like that. You can go into a store and buy them. The two Chinese ones, are, one of them is there, the Enreal. Effectively, that allows the tethering with a company called USB, linking it to your smartphone. It has the Qualcomm chips, which are enabled for 5G, which are also good for the gaming. Um, <clears throat> and then High Scene has been slightly more focused on the sort of enterprise side around healthcare and telemedicine and other things. So it's, it's early days. Price point's not there. Clunky, but I think directionally, this is an interesting area to follow. On the enterprise side, we've also seen some, some acquisitions. We've seen some investments, which effectively are laying the foundations to you know, virtual teleconferencing with holograms. Um, and this is, whether it's a standalone company like Lightfield Lab, which got funding from some of the usual suspects in terms of the, the telecom operators, whether it's Magic Leap, which bought a very interesting Belgium startup called Mimesis, which is effectively helping for the platform for Magic, Magic Leap's um, headset on the enterprise side to have those sort of holograms. And Alibaba and many others are investing, obviously, heavily on that. Also, the equipment suppliers on the telecom side, so the Cisco's, Huawei, and, and the likes. So this is a very in interesting area on, this, on the enterprise side. Now, <clears throat> one area that's important in addition to power and display is obviously where does it all go? Because <laughs> a sort of computer is a little bit easier to put a number of things in it, and Apple and others have done a good job in terms of minimalizing that. But I think if you're looking at just the sort of glasses or tomorrow even just lenses or a chip, you might need to sort of think about the size element. So this is a, a very interesting uh, company from, from Silicon Valley, Mojo Vision, which got a 100 million raising. <laughs> What's interesting is they have a, a gallium nitride technology around micro LED for the, for the display. <clears throat> and effectively, this is a very small insect. And that is what they claim to be the size of what they're doing. So you can imagine if you had some specs and if you effectively have invisible computing, you're no longer worried about having a big box with the power and then the battery and then the connectivity. It's all seamless. Now, like many of these early stage companies, I'm not saying it's completely rolled out. I'm not saying it's workable. No one really knows. These are investments that are 
I guess the investors that made the due diligence had access to some information, but it's, it's early days. But once again, if, I think if you look at the trajectory and if you're looking at pretty much every single thing that has existed since sort of the beginning of Earth on the electronics and technology size, miniaturization hasn't failed. There's not a year where there's not more power, cheaper, smaller. So I think that's probably a good indication as to where things are going and what will make it more manageable in terms of aesthetics and functionality. Fascinating area, again, very early days, a little bit hyped, but, but haptic is, allows you to effectively feel and touch. So instead of just having the visual of the, the XR, instead of having the sound, which I think you know, sound and communication has been invented for, for some time, if you're able to feel, that leaves you with basically seeing, hearing, feeling in an XR environment, it's, it's quite powerful. One particular company raised 16 million haptics and a good name for the sector, half of which was this year. <clears throat> and these are, are gloves which have pneumatic actuators which allow the feel. So effectively, to be clear, you're not touching anything or someone else is touching something and as far as you're concerned, it's as if you were touching it because it's reacting in exactly the same way, um, pressure and other features, localization, as if you were there. So they're working on the first haptic telerobotic system to transmit touch from anyone anywhere in the world or beyond. And there's also some research, I mean, I just highlighted that with Northwestern University who have made a breakthrough in terms of a patch which allows that through vibrations because big astronaut suit maybe is a bit clunky, but what's interesting is that again, coming back to the miniaturization theme, you have the universities and if you're getting that through a little patch, that's pretty interesting. Industry 5.0, so the distinction, most of you in the room will know, but the, the 4.0 versus 5.0, and again, these are just random acronyms, but <laughs> for what they're worth, it's an increasing interaction and collaboration between the AI side, the robotics, the humans, and the technology. Personally, I find this slightly more deceptive and disappointing for now than <clears throat> other areas. I think Upskill got a very big funding, but effectively, it's helping with goggles on the enterprise side, with training and security. It's very important, but it doesn't hit directly the manufacturing per se or the production. Those obviously who historically have led on the, on the, on the manufacturing and the production side, it's obviously the CAD, CAM, PLMM players, right? It's Dassault System, it's Autodesk, it's PTC, all these guys. And they've all made significant acquisitions, in particular PTC, but I would say, to be fair, most of those acquisitions by PTC have been VR-related and are relevant. Autodesk has mainly been R&D and good PR around the collaboration and that. And I'm not saying that they're not there, but it feels for now that it's more an extension of the CAD-CAM model and what they've been doing for decades with a collaborative element, which they've been doing for decades, which they're now embracing the XR technology to leverage on, as opposed to any real break breakthroughs per se, or at least it's not discernible yet from the outside. But I have no doubt that they'll be going there and getting there. It's just that it's not decodable so clearly for, for now. And then, of course, you have other elements of connectivity on the enterprise side. Um, RealWare <coughs> raised 80 million, um, and these effectively <coughs> allow AR um, goggles and platforms to connect everyone and all that. Materials display and materials technology, I think, is a, is a fascinating area. I'm personally a huge fan of this area. I think that when you look at the, the waveguide display that DigiLens is, is developing for the glasses themselves, there's incredible technology going on there, which is extraordinarily complex. When you look at Corning, obviously, for the Gorilla Glass um, <coughs> and supported by Apple, all the display solutions for the smart, smart glasses, again, these are extraordinarily complex in terms of technology and, and continued investment we saw in 2019 in both those areas. One of a nice Swiss company called Weiwei, an Alibaba-backed AR company, 
um, to allow effectively the data to be directly projected onto the windscreen. That's the photo you see there, it's a bit blurred, but effectively it's, it's the mix between the normal display and um, <clears throat> windshield you have with, with sort of overlaying data on that. And then, again, coming back to the hardware side and Israel, which is obviously cutting edge with regard to all the sort of hardware edge technology, are the chips behind all that. And they was a particularly interesting one for the, for the chips which are powering the, these displays, in particular for, for auto. So these are areas which I find very critical to the engines um, for a lot of the, you know, what one then sees for consumer as well as the enterprise. You would have all taken note of, of Facebook's acquisition, and of course it, it got a bit of noise, and it's not because Facebook does it that it necessarily is the right thing, the right price, and certainty that they'll reach where they want to, but it's still worthy of, of spending a minute or two on that. Science fiction until science fact. The photo on the right, for those who don't know it, it's a Bandersnatch from Black Mirror, and Bandersnatch from Black Mirror, effectively, it's a clever Netflix, um, has a version which they're showing where you can decide at the end what series and how you want the episode to end, but the main feature about Bandersnatch is effectively brain-computer interface. And the reason I'm making this analogy is that Facebook, who are investing considerably in these areas, acquired a company called Control Labs for what is meant to be 500 to a billion dollars, which I don't think anybody knows for sure, and that's a neural interface platform. Admittedly, it's the gadget on the, on the right. It's an impulse armband. How precise is it and how clunky is it? And that, you know, one doesn't know. And the impulses are one thing from an armband. It's not the same as a brain. Um, but there is a lot of developments on the brain-computer interface. And these electrical impulses are, are still noteworthy as you're sort of dematerializing sensors and dematerializing the controllers and the smartphones and that. You have at the same time Project Orion, which is a strategic partnership between Facebook and Ray-Ban, or in particular Ray-Ban's parent company, Luxottica, which does glass and glassware. And effectively, the purpose of that would be to take calls to have the connectivity as well. So you're dematerializing, effectively, the smartphone. You don't need a smartphone anymore because you have that. So it's pretty interesting. If you communicate directly, you don't have a smartphone anymore. Um, that's what that's looking like. <clears throat> a fun point quote by Michio Kaku, the connectivity and the convergence between different technologies. Now, for those who don't know Michio Kaku, he's a very well-regarded, he's not just a speculative futurist, he's actually an engineer, an extraordinarily well-regarded Japanese scientist. Um, <clears throat> but I'm just throwing it out there because you can see that we're starting to play with potentially elements around what's in and what's out, and, and space travel how far are you from space travel if you can feel, hear, smell, touch something remotely? There was a very interesting article in the Wall Street Journal today around uh, <coughs> digital teleportation. So this is just for fun, and as we wrap up, you know, what could the next few years look like? What's in? Communications will be key post-5G. Anything to do with natural language processing, in my mind, will be absolutely critical, and the AJI chips, and the NLP is in particular for if you're speaking directly to the glasses and no longer keyboards or anything like that, that that's where that becomes critical. Artificial reality in real virtual life or in virtual real life, what's the distinction? Brain-computer interface, human-machine interactions on the see here feel. Space travel is not that absurd and, you know, depending on how we define it, time travel, I'll let you sort of think about that over lunch. Um, <clears throat> materials technology, I think, is important. Nano. And then uh, an anacronym, which I haven't seen anywhere, but I copyright if it doesn't exist, which is delocalized, experiential, immersive, and personalized, which I think is for everything the way things are going. And collaborative, very interesting 3D spatial viewer in, in, um, in China where effectively they had a very complex surgical procedure where they had different doctors and surgeons as experts in different places in China operating on someone very remote in China, big country. So these are, these are quite interesting. And then what's out, and again, this is just for fun, smartphones, don't know, devices, keyboards, consoles, your basic CAD cam, um, 
training manuals, classrooms, tuition books, video conferencing, and in real life, maybe. I haven't let tons of time for questions, but I'll let Amy as a moderator tell me whether I theoretically have 16 seconds, but I'm available for longer if. <laughs> yeah, we do a quick one if uh, someone has a question. Go ahead. Where do you think the biggest first you know, financial hit? So hit as in the potential or someone or train crash? No, potential. Potential. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, listen, I think train crash is quite easy, right? Anything, if you take the, I forget the precise numbers, but I think there's a theoretical paper valuation of close to 50 billion. I think half of that is the top 20 companies, and within that you have probably, you know, 5, 10 billion, which is a few companies, okay? So any one of those that gets reworked, well, you can do the maths that, you know, a lot of people will lose money on that. So that will happen like, like anything, you know. Uh, so I think the train crashes will happen for some of the larger investments that get very delayed or that don't get as pervasive or someone gets there quicker or whatever. Listen, I don't have a, have a view of that, honestly, but it, you know, if there was a candidate just by virtue of it being uh, the size and the investments, that, that could be easier than others. But what I would say, and you know, I don't mean to draw analogies with WeWork, but we works interesting because it doesn't put into question the direction of, of the way people are working tomorrow, the fact that people are co-working, of the model. And then there's a valuation point. So, of course, you guys need to get the maths right and the economics and the returns on the investment. But I would say that, it, to me, it doesn't put into question the strategic orientation. Then in terms of the opportunity, I think it's just a question of timing, whether it's you know, a year or two, next five years, et cetera. I personally think that if you take a longer time frame, it's every single industry, every single sector, and it's pervasive. If you talk, take shorter time frames, it's areas which are already easy to roll out. So it's gaming, it's uh, you know, some of these areas that don't require any particular breakthroughs where you're not sure of the price point yet, whether people embrace it, um, et cetera. 